Mark chapter number 6. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. It says, And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judah, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. By the way, uh, what do Catholics do with that verse? Anyway, uh, verse number four. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk, and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went round about the villages teaching. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for another opportunity to come out to your house. Lord, we're thankful for the rain. It had been a little dry this past week. And Lord, uh, I pray it would uh, rain a little bit around here tonight, Lord, that you'd just rain out uh, uh, drops of blessings on your people. Lord, I pray that you'd use this unworthy vessel, that you'd hide me behind the cross. And Lord, I pray that you'd put a, a bit about my tongue, Lord, a bridle about my head, a hedge around my thoughts, Lord. And I pray that uh, you'd give me the words to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, verse number Verse number one, and he went out. Well, where'd he go out from? Well, Mark chapter number five, a great chapter. Very powerful chapter. We find a lot of things in Mark chapter number five. Well, first off, we find a madman in Gadara. Cast out a legion of devils into a herd of swine. All right, they found this man who had cut himself, who had they chained the tombs and he'd break the chains. They found this man that used to, every chance he got, he was either harming himself or he's trying to find a way to harm somebody else. He lived among dead folk because he couldn't stand to be allowed around the living. That's how much torment this guy was under. And then they found him clothed in his right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus. Yeah. That guy went on to be, well, I don't know if he was a preacher or a teacher, but he was a great witness for Jesus because sure. by the time Jesus came back, everybody came out to hear him. Sure. Right? Yeah. Great work done in that man's life. Then we get the woman with the issue of blood. Had for 12 years had such faith that she said, I don't even need him to look at me. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, Amen. my problems would be taken care of. Amen. Right then, along the same line, 12-year-old girl is sick as her father's talking to Jesus. Come to find out, no, she's already dead. And Jesus said, hey, don't worry about it. We're going to go take care of this. Amen. He walked in, he said, hey, not dead, she's just sleeping. Everybody else says, when you sleep, your heart doesn't stop working. And they mocked him to scorn. And then he went over, lift, took her up by the hand, and hey, she's alive. Right? Great chapter. And then chapter 6. So keep in mind, his disciples went with him. First thing I want you to notice. It wasn't just Jesus. It's him and the ones that he had called to follow him. Now can you imagine 12 disciples? Say, man, yeah, I can't believe everything he did in that last town. I mean, how in the world is it, is it going to get any better than that? Right and around here, the past couple of weeks, services, hey, it's been great. Wouldn't trade it for the world. I'm just drooling at you know, what God wants to do next. And then it says, verse number, or at the end of verse number one, he went into his own country. And they're thinking, man, we're going to where God grew up. It's going to be great. Right, we're going to the place where, you know, Jesus cut, you know, 12 years old, he's in the temple in Jerusalem baffling the best scholars of his day. They say, I can't wait to see what these people are doing, how on fire they are from God. I mean, they lived in the same town as the Son of God. Surely this is going to be great. Right, verse number two. And when the Sabbath day was come, well, where are you going to find God on God's day in God's house? He began to teach, and many hearing him were astonished. They were dumbfounded. We see that they departed. We see the disciples. But now there's a whole bunch of people. It, he literally blew their mind. They start talking about just like the men on the road to Emmaus. Can you imagine God teaching about how much God loves you, and all he wants you to do is repent? and receive forgiveness for sins. That's right. Well, he gets up, he starts. He says they were astonished. 
And then they started doubting. It says, from whence hath this man these things? Where did he figure all this out at? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? They said, how did he get so smart that his hands started healing people? They weren't trying to figure out who he was. They were trying to figure out how he did. No, nope, Nobody disputed what he said. They were just trying to figure out how he did it. They were start, their mind was blown and they're saying, how in the world did all this happen? Okay, well, verse number three, they start, you know, again, continuing with the doubting. Now they start bringing up his kinsmen. Say, so is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? They got that part right. It wasn't the son of Joseph, but he was the son of Mary. And he was raised to be a carpenter. Right? What? It says, you know, the brother of James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon. And are not his sisters here with us? They're saying, we can look around and know that he's related to them. Yeah. But you're also forgetting that he's the son of the father. Right. Yeah. Obviously, they didn't know him too well. Because here they are trying to bring up who he is, and they don't know nothing about him. You're telling me that God walked among you for, I don't know, let's say 29 years, because we know that, you know, around 30, he gets baptized into his earthly ministry. That was God's appointment to say, all right, it begins now, and then for about three and a half years or so, he did everything in the Gospels. But for 29, 30 years, the Son of God's walking among Now, granted, he hasn't manifested himself yet. He hasn't showed out that he's the Son of God. But when he was 12, everybody in Jerusalem couldn't figure out how he knew the things that he knew. Right? If they knew him as well as they thought they would, surely they would have heard about the marriage of Canaan. Yeah. How they ran out of stuff to drink, and he made more of it. And it's better than the best that they already had. Amen. I mean, we're only six chapters into Mark's gospel, but his fame had already been spread abroad. Continue reading down after this. There's so many people talking about Jesus. Herod thought that John the Baptist was raised from the dead. Right? He's saying there's nobody else that could do the things that John did. So it's got to be John. Well, that was just him feeling guilty because he actually had an appreciation for John, but then he was hornswoggled into killing him. That, that's, that's the old Hamlet complex. Down at the water trying to wash your hands of the blood of somebody that you knew you shouldn't have killed. I mean, they say that Pilate did that for years to come after Jesus. He said, he washed his hands of it. He said, this isn't my decision, it's yours. But he still couldn't get over the guilt of crucifying the Son of God. Yeah. Right, you're telling me that he lived among them. They try to bring up who he's related to, but they're ignoring everything that he's doing right in front of them. Sure. John chapter number 3, Nicodemus comes and says, we know that no man can do the things that you do unless God's with him. Right? He still missed that it wasn't that God was with him. He was God. But even the Pharisees, the most you know, dignified and the ones that had everything figured out, they said, we know, we, got, we know enough to know that God's with you. So what must I do to inherit eternal life? But this crowd never got even that far. This crowd said, where in the world did he figure this out at? Because if he can do it, we can do it. That's what he's just a carpenter. I mean, his brothers and sisters aren't anybody special, so he must not be anybody special. Then, Jesus says unto him, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And we've heard our pastor say it for years. The hardest people for you to win are the people that know you the best. Especially those that know you before you got saved. Because Jesus may forget it, the Father may forget it, the Holy Ghost is never going to remind you of it, but people don't forget what you used to be. There's things we do after we get saved that people aren't going to forgive us for. And if it's those that's closest to us, and hey, those things, they may not forgive you for living for Jesus. Sometimes you may mess up and they may not forgive you for that. But either way, because of their closeness to you, Sometimes it takes somebody from the outside coming in and saying, nope, they're right. 
Everything that they, some plant, some water, God will give the increase. But here, we're not talking about prophet. We're talking about the Son of God. I can understand somebody thinking, well, who in the world's Jordan? Right? Why would I want to go and hear Jordan preach? Right? I get that. That makes sense to me. I don't want to hear me preach. Right? I can't listen back to it because apparently I sound different in my head than I do on recording. <laughs> and it drives me nuts. Right? But in addition to that, also, I'm sitting there and I'm critiquing myself the whole time. I've just had to take it on faith that if God told me to say it while I was up here, it's going to come out the way that He gave it to me, and that's good enough for me. But, Jesus is saying, a prophet without honor, I can get that. I mean, I can see somebody growing up with Elijah and remembering the time that, you know, Elijah may or may not have, all right, we're taking a little bit of liberty here, but maybe Elijah grew up and was, you know, wild and crazy like Christian, chucking rocks up onto the house of God, right, from out in the gravel parking lot. Right? He got the nickname Mad Dog because he used to, when he was real little, go around and just bite people for no reason. Right? I was convinced he was half possessed. But anyway. <laughs> right? When asked, why do you want to play football? His answer was, because I want to hurt somebody. <laughs> okay, maybe he was like that. And I could see one of them kids that, you know, Elijah may have bit or thrown a rock at, or if he's Christian, hit his older brother in the head with a hammer with. Uh... Dad, dad's told that story before. Christian was real little. He's, dad's just making up a goofy song. And he goes, there's a fly on Jordan's head. And Christian hit it with a hammer. Well, Christian went and got a hammer and hit me in the head with it. So really, it's dad's fault. I might have a few more IQ points if it wasn't for that. Okay? But see, we remember those things. But if that person was to come to you with the very words of God... Sometimes people can't look past what they know. Right. And here it's not a prophet. It's the very son of God's talking. And they can't get over that he lived down the street for some 20 years or so. Because we know that he was in Nazareth for a little bit. Bethlehem. We, he's all over the place. Especially when that famine hit. God sent a dream to Joseph and said, Hey, get out of there. And I'm going to take care of you in a strange land. But it's... A, it's much as they thought they knew him, they didn't know him. But then verse number 5, we see the disabling. He could not do, he could not there do, and he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went round about the villages teaching. Because of their doubt, it hindered God from doing what God wanted to do. Now I know, for God so loved the world. But I also know God loved the people in that town just as much as he loved anybody else. And it pained the heart of God. Jesus marveled. You got to do something pretty big to surprise God. And that's taking liberty. It didn't surprise him. But how could they have such unbelief? He was he raised in the town. He knows what they were taught in the temple every week. He knows the way that they claim to love God. He knows the way that they go and they live their life. And he's saying they do so much, but they just can't accept the very words of God. And it bound his hands. He couldn't do what he wanted to in the midst of them because they didn't believe. Without faith, it's impossible to please them. Because of their doubt, some sick folk got help. But he left the city and taught in the villages around it. He said, if you don't want me, I'll go somewhere else. And he did. I don't find that he ever comes back to his hometown. I don't find that any of the disciples went back to the hometown. But he's saying, you may not know when God's going to come back around your direction. You may say no one too many times. Now imagine. Everywhere Jesus went, where do you find him? In the synagogue teaching. Sometimes on Sabbath day, sometimes not on Sabbath day. He'd just go to the house of God and start telling people about God. Right? That's where he did a lot of healing. That's where he did a lot of teaching. 
It's where the Pharisees would come and try and accuse him, and he'd just rebuke them with the Word of God. Imagine, because in order to do that, you had to be of a certain age in the Hebrew times. But imagine, for how many years, he may have just gotten up and read the Word of God. If God is reading the Word of God to you, it's going to sound different. It's going to hit a little bit harder. I mean, again, we've already mentioned the men on the road to amaze. They said their hearts burned within them as he talked. I don't know if he did that. But I do know that they saw a life that not according to my opinion, not according to your opinion, not according to anybody else's opinion, but according to God's opinion, was spotless, perfect, sinless. I know a lot of good people. I also know that they mess up. Right? I also know that as much as you may want to do good, sometimes you just get caught up in a moment or you have a lapse where you're not thinking about something and you do something wrong. Amen. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Okay? Amen. But to have somebody living among you that was sinless? You're telling me you wouldn't notice that? Right. Somebody that never did anything wrong? And he gets up and starts teaching and it doesn't click. Oh. Remember how we used to say, that kid never does anything wrong. Well, maybe, just maybe, it's because he's the son of God. Y'all remember that story about how Mary, you know, they said that, you know, her and Joseph got together before they got married, but, you know, everybody says, nope, it's the Holy Ghost. Maybe that was true. Y'all remember that story when they said, you know, they left him in Jerusalem for, you know, a day out and then a day back? And they find him in the temple, and he's got everybody, you know, jaw on the ground from teaching. Maybe that would, maybe they weren't lying on that one. You know that guy that we've been hearing about that's been doing all these miracles? Maybe that's him. Never click. They couldn't get over that that was the Jesus that they knew. They couldn't accept the Jesus that he wanted to be for them. So with the Lord's help, we're going to teach on jeering Jesus. J e e r jeering Jesus that word jeering means to scoff it means to in a sarcastic way repeat back the words it means that instead of hearing it you're looking for excuses to discredit it and they didn't do it inwardly look at verse number 3 is this not the carpenter the son of Mary they're questioning each other hey isn't this him he looks the same but he don't sound the same Right? I remember when he grew up down the street. He was always a good kid, but where did he learn all this from? Right? In other words, that'd be like Elmer Fudd getting up here and giving a math class and everybody saying, where did Elmer Fudd learn how to count? He can't even catch a single rabbit. <laughs> but they could find no fault in him, so they said, well, where did he find this magical knowledge at? Well, they didn't ask him. You notice that? They asked each other. They didn't confront their doubt. They held on to it and in, in private started whispering among each other. Now, what's the application? God been doing great things around here. We've been through a, a little bit of chapter number five. Okay, we've had some folk, verse number five, that had been sick. Well, some were sick to sin. They got saved. Jesus touched them, and they've been different. We've had some that were sick in a foreign country and then God brought them back to the Father's house. Right? I don't know how many hearts that were hurt have been healed because Jesus has touched them in the meeting. But that's all he could do in their town. What are we going to allow God to do around here? He could only heal a few sick because a few sick had enough faith to believe, I believe that guy can help me. I believe what he taught in the temple. But because of many having unbelief, he could not do great and mighty works in their town. I mean, some places you go to, Jesus turned that place smack dab upside down. Like Gadara in chapter number 5. He'd come back. I don't know how long it was. I'm sure I could give you an estimate, but if it was important, the Bible would have told us. But at some point, he goes away, and the bad man wanted to come with him. He said, no, nah, I'm going with you. He said, you did for me what no man could do for me. He said, they even stopped trying to help me. 
They were just trying to contain me. But you clothed me. You gave me my sanity back. And I want to give my life to you. And Jesus says, that's great, but I want you to give your life to me here. Amen. And instead of saying, well, if you don't want me, I don't want you. He said, okay, Lord. And he went and he told them. Amen. He went and told them all the pain, all the suffering that he had been in. And then how the master one day showed up. That man wasn't even in control of his own body. I can't imagine what it's like to have a thousand voices in your head, all of them trying to do something else, and you not having any power. I know that there are some people out there, I'm convinced there's some people out there possessed. Maybe not with a thousand, but I do know that there's one that can cast them out. So, great things happened tonight. He came back, the whole town came out to see him. They said, if he can help him, he can help me. No man could help him, so God must have done the work. But here in his own town, where did he learn all that at? Who taught him that? How did he learn that? Hammer and nails into you know, some wooden legs. Back then, they may have even had the old wooden nails, not even iron nails. Can you imagine somebody working in a carpentry shop and everything that they make is always perfectly level? Right, that'd be diff He never drove a bad nail, Brother Bob. They knew he was a carpenter, but they weren't associated with this handiwork. Well, God's been showing up around here. How many of us still aren't acquainted with what God's doing around here? See, the thing about why they doubted him, he changed everything that they knew about God. He challenged it. Weekly, those that would get up in the temple... He had two sects. The Apostle Paul used it to his advantage one time when he was on trial. He had the Pharisees and he had the Sadducees. Both of them. Religious, which also made them political leaders in the communities. But they didn't agree on everything. Pharisees believed that there was a resurrection after death. That God could raise the dead. That one day, even though we die here, we could be resurrected to live with him forevermore. Sadducees thought that there was no life beyond the grave. And there's a whole lot of more things we don't have time to get into, but not everybody agreed. But what they did agree on was the law. And they said, you have to do works. They said, if you don't do works, you're not right with God. And if you're not right with God, sometimes they'd ostracize people, they'd kick them out of town. I mean, they were laying in wait for that woman that was caught in the act of adultery. Why? Because they wanted to get rid of her. They're saying, we've had enough of you around here. What you're doing isn't right with God, and we're going to you know, kick you out. They brought her to Jesus. I don't know what Jesus wrote, but Jesus started writing it, and they all disappeared. Jesus started going and said no more. Right, The woman at the well was ostracized because her life would bring shame to anybody else that associated with her. Under the time, I mean, she had many husbands. The one that she was with wasn't her husband. Right? And you could tell that she was ashamed because she wasn't boastful when she went out to the well. She went out humbly. She wasn't trying to draw attention to herself. She's just trying to get water. Even if it was hot water. Even if most of it would evaporate before she could get back home in the hot heat. But she was going to get water to take care of her family. And she said, I do love my family. And she met the one that loved her more than she loved her family. And then she went back and she forgot her water pot. She said, no, there's something more important. She told the whole town. But she wasn't allowed to go get water with the other women because it would have disgraced or dishonored the women that were trying their best to live for God. Right? This was a world of judgment. They were under constant judgment. Not just for a man, God. They were using God's laws to condemn people. Right? That's why if the Son sets you free, you're free from the law. All judgment's been committed to Him. Right? He broke the chains of the law. So he, he came in. They're used to getting up and hearing what the prophet said, how God's a God of judgment, how if we don't live the way that God wants us to live, He'll you know, pour out fire and brimstone like He did on Sodom and Gomorrah. All that's still true. God hates sin. 
the fact that sin exists attacks the holiness and righteousness of God those that sin are unrepentant and want to continue that way make themselves the enemies of God that's why the Bible says that Esau was the enemy of God not because God hated Esau because Esau hated God and he challenged everything that they thought they knew can you imagine hearing that your entire life and then one day he gets up and starts preaching hey there's this thing called repentance and there's this thing called forgiveness because used to they only got their sins pushed back for a year he said no 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 I'm not talking about a year I'm saying gone I mean we heard about the man when brother Bobby preached on getting the clay out of the way when they lowered him through that roof what he say? He said, Thy sins be forgiven. Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. He didn't say your sins are pushed back for a year and then you're going to be lame again. No, no, no. Gone. Amen. What's gone mean? Not around no more. They're not hidden. They're not behind his back. They're not as far from the idiot. Gone is what the Bible says. And when you heard that for the first time, it didn't make much sense to you either. Amen. And it took the Holy Ghost doing a little bit of work on you in order for you to understand that hey he really did mean what he said but they had everything that they had ever heard challenged and they bucked up on God they said oh that's different I don't like different I understand the old way I understand the prophets because I've heard it my whole life right, what's God telling you that you're not comfortable with because that's when you start jeering God we're fine coming out and sitting down on the pew and saying, okay, God, I'm here, use me. No, 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 no. This is where we come to give honor, reverence, and the best that we have back to God for all that he's done for us. This is worship. This is easy. Sometimes it's hard to get here, but once you get here, it's always better. Right? Sometimes it's all you can do to fight traffic and not commit, you know, vehicular manslaughter on the way here. And you got to repent in the parking lot before you can come in. Get right with God. But when you get here, you know the Spirit of God's going to be here. The presence of God's going to be here. God's going to sit down among you. It's all going to be okay. Right? Yeah, I had to wrestle my flesh all the way here, but now God's here. It's only by the grace of God that I made it here, so I'm going to give honor and praise back unto God get to singing about how great the Father's love for us is and you start tearing up a little bit get a little misty eyed because you realize yeah that's me not talking about somebody that I can say you know well, maybe they you know merited just the attention of God we know that they can't merit the love of God but maybe they were doing their best maybe you know God could have pity on them I don't understand how he could do it for me but these people instead of saying well hang on a second let's sit down and see what this guy says they said no that's different than what we've heard before well, we all hear the same thing at first. What's that? Repent. Then we all hear the same thing also. Conform. He made you a new creature. You're going to either give in to what he wants to make you or you're going to buck up against it. But most Christians, they're just so happy to be saved, they don't even think about it. They give it all to God. Then what's, what's next? Well, the first step of obedience after you get saved to show that you're going to do your best to follow after the things of God, what we've done the past two Sundays. Dunk people in some water. Right? That's an outward rep representation of what's done on the inside. But it's also one of the requirements for membership in the church of God. Amen. Not that church of God, the church, the only one that God founded. Right? Amen. That's just saying, I want to be obedient. I want to make the outward representation like Jesus, Jesus was the son of God but until God ordained it for him to be baptized his ministry didn't start for God because he did on the inside what he did for me I want to do something for him that's what it's saying and he can't do anything for him outside the local church outside of the authority of the local church so what's it saying I want to be a part of what God's doing and then some people stop there they're happy sitting on a pew and God may call them to say, hey, why don't you go talk to somebody? That's different. 
I got used to my little routine, and that's different. Well, hey, revival happened. There's a whole lot of people getting help. Yeah, but I don't need that kind of help, Lord. Thank you. It's just been good services. You say, you're crazy. No, because if everybody got in, this place, it'd get outside these walls. There'd be people stopping in saying, hey, we heard something was happening. Well, who told them? I don't know. Maybe God did. We drove by and God said, pull in here. He said, that don't happen. Yeah, it does. I've seen it before. I've been in a meeting in Mexico where the family was just driving on their way to a different church. And they said, God told us to pull in here. As far as I know, they never left. But see, we don't like it when God changes. Not himself. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But when he changes what he wants us to do. Sometimes it's a time to grow. Sometimes it's a time to plant. Sometimes it's a time to go out and harvest. But only God knows what he wants out of your life. And we get to thinking that we know what God wants out of our life. These people thought that they knew what it took to merit the favor of God. I was bringing some animals, sacrificing them, that they'd come and they'd have a sacrifice for you know when a child was born they had a sacrifice for when they committed sin they had a sacrifice for when they wanted to give praise and honor under God they had it all down you know check boxes and everything okay this is what I need today this is the animal that I need this is what I need to do this is what I need to do to purify myself they understood it all they know the thing about faith you're not going to understand it all faith is the essence of things hope for the substance of things not seen Faith is stepping out when there's nothing and expecting God to catch you before you hit the fall or hit the ground before you fall. Why? Because you're an idiot? No, because God said to do it. When was the last time that God gave you a burden so bad that you get you just stayed up all night, didn't even think about going to bed because you wanted to pray all night long so that God would move on that burden? That's what happens in revival. You know what a burden is? That's God showing to you how important it is, whatever it is, is to Him. And you just get a glimpse of how much God wants to do it, and it burns itself into your heart, and God gives you a burden for something. God gives you a burden, you're not going to be able to get rid of it. Go look at Jonah. You may have a burden, and you may forget it. But if God gives it to you, it's going to stick. Maybe... God wants you to go. When was the last time you just fasted? When the pastor didn't call for a churchwide fast? Because God purposed on your heart, if you're really serious about this, or if you really want somebody to get saved on Sunday, maybe you just spend some more time with Him, and whatever it is that you're giving up just isn't important enough. Lord, I don't want that if it means not having you. And maybe a fast will turn into him changing you, molding you, making you. How many of us want to be pretty vessels on a shelf? They call us vessels of honor, but you know what vessels of honor are meant for? To be used. They aren't museum pieces. And just because they are vessels of honor doesn't mean that they're without flaw. It means that they're reliable and you know what you're going to get when you reach for it. Some of us buck up on God because we don't want to be used. We just want God to make us into something that people will say, wow. Well, I know me. No wow here. Right? I'm wearing one of my favorite suits. It even stretches. it got spandex in it. I love these suits, bro, Josh. <laughs> it's great. I can do this and nothing bad happens. I don't bust any seams. Right? If I was still able of doing like deep stretches, I could do it in the suit. Can't do that no more though. I'm out of shape now. But see, we've got a problem. Think, well, people aren't supposed to do things like that in a suit. Well, pretty vessels are supposed to be in museums. No, tools are meant to be used. Amen. If God wants you to be a pickaxe, how much glory can you bring hanging on a shelf at a Home Depot? As far as anybody else is concerned, that's just another piece of junk nobody thought was worth buying. 
But if you say, all right, Lord, go hit me up against some rocks. If that's what you want to do, I'm all yours. How do you find out that the pickaxe is stronger than the rock? You got to hit it with it. How do you know that it's not a one-off? You got to keep hitting it. Right? Some of the best tools are the ones that are usually the dirtiest, or they got a little bit of rust on them, or you can't even see the label on them anymore. And you say, I don't want that one. That one's a piece of junk. Well, you can go buy something that's got a fiberglass handle, but it's not going to last the same way that that east wing does. It's got the tang all the way down it. Right? How do you know? You've got to test it. God may have, some of y'all, during revival saying, hey, I want to test you, but you don't want to get off the shelf. I want to put you into the front lines, but you're saying, no, I like it over here. I mean, you know what the purpose of a jug is? To get water from where the water came from to where you can drink it. The jug doesn't have to be all that pretty. In fact, most of the time, they're just made out of clay. Very little decoration. If it was decorated, it was for somebody that was, you know, really special. Well, God's going to make you perfect, but he's also going to make you unique. That's why he saved you. Only you can do what God wants you to do. Right? You are... In his eyes, perfect because you're robed in the righteousness of his son, but you also have a purpose. And when you say, no, God can't do for you what God wants to do for you, you're binding the hands of Jesus. You're saying, Lord, I don't want that many blessings in my life. I'm already, I'm already blessed enough as is. Hogwash. Right? I need all the blessing I can get. I need to be pressed down, shaking, bubbling over. Amen. Because I don't know like, if you guys have noticed this, I can be a little stoic sometimes. And unless it's bubbling out of me, people may not notice. Because I've got the face when I'm not paying attention, people think that I'm angry. That's just the way that it looks. Can't help it. Right? And yes, I may have a natural sarcastic tinge to my voice. Sometimes people don't think I'm serious. No, that's pretty serious. That was that God working on me. He said, "Well, if it stays on the shelf, you may not realize how much that jug really can do for you." Now you say, "Well, it's just another milk cart. It's just another hammer. It's just another serving plate." But see, some serving plates, you bump them up against something, they're going to shatter. Other serving plates. You can have people drop stuff on it. You can have things fall off of it. But there's just something about that one, it just fits in the hand right. It balances right. People are saying, you know what? This serving plate, this is a different serving plate. Right? Whoever made this knew what they were doing. Well, how do you figure that? You've got to test it. That's why when somebody comes out with a new product, they've got that thing called R&D. They research it, but then they develop it. And then there are these things that they call Marks MK. Mark 1 is the first one. And usually there's a whole lot between 1 and whatever number they finish at because they're trying to figure out all the flaws with it. Well, God doesn't need all them trial and errors. He just needs us to say, all right, Lord, remove from me what you don't want, put in me what you do want, and then use me. Some of us bucked up on God. God's telling us just do something that makes us feel uncomfortable well what makes us feel uncomfortable usually when we get outside of our comfort zone Amen. you know what revival is doing stuff you had never did before because your love for God is stronger than it ever was before yeah. it's to bring back that joy of the espousals you made in your youth in your young Christianity where you're ready to light the world on fire because you love Jesus so much but what happened? He's still the same. Amen. I've changed. Revivals to get me back to that enthusiasm, that excitement, but also now tempered with experience. Amen. To go out and to do and to be used, but to be used according to His will. Because a lot of people get excited, go out and make a mess of it. But it's easy. It's easier. Let's say it that way. It's easier to be in the Army when you're on the base in Fort Benning, Georgia, 
than it is over in Iraq or Afghanistan or Germany or Japan or any of the other places that we've got bases around the world. It's easy to be at home. It's hard to be on the front lines. Some of us have been on guard duty so long that when he says, all right, time to head to the front, you say, well, I don't quite enjoy the thought of that so much. We're not supposed to endure hardness as a good watcher of Jesus. No, soldier of Jesus Christ. We are never to turn our back to the enemy. That's why our armor, the whole armor of God, has no back. God's got my back. That's enough for me. But that armor, it's not to protect that vessel of honor that he's got... Because again, if you're being used and the, the token that something is used but it's also worth its value is it can get a little scratched up. It can get a little dinged up and it can still keep going. Right? Like that Energizer Bunny. Doesn't matter what happens to it. It can be raining. You could lose whatever it is. You put that thing into a flashlight, it's going to work. Right? Doesn't matter how long it's been sitting in the drawer. If it hadn't been used, it's still good. Right, you can cut the label off of it. You can paint something different on it. It may not look like an energy, but it still is an energizer on the inside. Doesn't matter what I look like. Doesn't matter what I've gone up against. As long as I can still do the thing that God wants me to do, Amen. then I'm a vessel of honor. We're going to get to heaven, and we're going to look at all the people that we thought would have been way up the chain. Now it's going to be those that were in the trenches every day on their face before God, pleading, shedding tears, and weeping for God to do something for their loved ones or people that they may never even met but got a burden for them because a missionary showed up and showed a video or a slide one day and God burned it onto their heart. It's going to be the people that were up at the wee hours on Saturday nights praying for their pastor that God just dump out an extra portion of the Holy Ghost on them so that sinners would come and get saved. Amen. It's going to be those people that said, all right, Lord, it may be difficult for me in the flesh, but because you want me to do it, I'll endure it as a good soldier. Tell me that anybody that's ever been in war endures having enemy fire shot at them. No, they don't enjoy it. They endure it. Why? Most of the time for the love of the brothers in arms, but for the love of their country. It may not be enjoyable. I imagine if you're a pot getting put on the oven and the heat cranked up, it isn't too enjoyable. But the heat don't last for forever. Right? There are moments where you get back off of the front line and God will say, all right, it's time to rest up. Balma Gilead, Rosa Sharon, Lily of the Valleys. But what we so often forget is, I'm not trusting that Brother Bob's going to know how to use me. I'm not trusting that Brother Josh is going to know how to use me. I'm trusting that the hand of God that made me is also going to be the hand that uses me. Amen. So he'll never do me wrong. And sometimes it may take me getting cracked and put back together for somebody to realize what he's got doesn't just make him into something that can be used, but it'll fix him if he gets broken. Anybody ever see them goofy flex tape commercials? <laughs> or flex glue, flex seal? What's the point of all that? Wow, this thing's really good at fixing stuff. But it may not be as good at fixing stuff as they claim. I wouldn't try and lift up, you know, like steel eye bars with it. <laughs> but I do believe if you got a crack in a bucket, you could stick that thing on it and it'd keep water from leaking. Right? They had that spray. They, what they don't tell you is you're supposed to spray it on the inside and on the outside and you're supposed to do coats of it and everything. But I believe if you pour enough of that stuff in there, it'll clog the hole. Right? It may take you 19 cans of that stuff, but eventually <laughs> you may have this much room left in the bucket, but it'll be fixed. But see, the sign of the Lord is, is He fixes you better than you were in the first place. When I realize, well, I don't really need that extra handle that the Lord never touched. Right? Or I didn't need that much decoration. Right? I'm tired of drawing attention to myself. I want Him to get the glory for it. And she just saying, I will not boast in anything. Save the Lord Jesus Christ. But see, it's uncomfortable to get up and say, all right, Lord, use me some way you've never used me before. 
Lord, take me somewhere that I've never been spiritually to help people that have no idea who I am or what you can do for them. And see, I watch too much YouTube and there's people that go out and they test all these survival tools. And I watch them just to see all the ones that cost like $900 and don't work. And then you get one for like 50 bucks that was made in the USA. Works perfect. But what do they do? They put this thing through everything that they can imagine. They try and chop branches off of trees with it. They're digging holes with it. Right there lighting fires with it. And you look at it and it fits in a pouch about this big. And you say, well, there's nothing special to that. Oh, just wait until God starts to use it. You may think, well, hey... How in the world is a shovel going to try to cut a tree down? Well, it's because it's got a you know, axe blade on one side of the shovel head. Well, how in the world is that going to cut wire? Because it's got a wire cutter built into the handle. Right? God's equipped it, but we got to be willing to go. You know when you need one of them all-purpose tools? When you're out in the middle of nowhere and you're in dire need. You don't carry one of them around with you when you're just walking around Walmart. Right? You carry one of them things around when you got four flat tires, you're out in the middle of the boonies, and you need to, you know, do something to find a place to sleep for the night. Right? Or your plane crashed into the middle of the desert and oh hey, I'm glad I got this shovel that does ninety different things. <laughs> but see, we think that's comical. There's a lot of people out there, their lives are crashed and they're looking for something that's real something that can stand up against the thing that's just beating against them every day and rolling them over and God wants to do something great for them but because we sit there and say well God's never asked me to do that before well God didn't want me to do that last year well, maybe you weren't ready last year maybe the people that God wanted to send you to weren't ready last year it's all his timing But see, I don't want verse number 6 to happen. And he marveled because of their unbelief and went round about the villages teaching. I don't want him to leave here and go other places and start talking, start showing out, start doing the things that he wanted to do here. I covet the presence of God, not because I don't want other people to have it. They can have it while we have it too. But I covet it because I know there's nothing like it. Because when he's in the camp, there's a different sound. People shout a little bit different. People live a little bit different. Because when he's in the camp, that joy starts bubbling up, unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. And it works its way out. It's one thing to see a hammer used to drive a nail. It's another thing to see a hammer used to drive a nail that wound up backswing it saying, glory to God, I drove another nail. But what find me anybody in the Bible that ever did anything for God the entire time they're praising they're singing they're giving God the glory for it when we stub up and we say well when did when did God want me to start doing that well, maybe he's always wanted to you just weren't serious enough for God to deal with you about it but when did God want to change that in my life now that's all that's important you say well that's callous it's not that easy no it's a hard thing to be a soldier for the Lord but he said that he'd be with us the entire way. He'd equip us to do it. And he'd be the one doing the work, not us. Maybe the problem is, is you're trying to make yourself into a vessel of honor. You're trying to use yourself for the honor and glory of God. A tool is always best in the hand of a master. And I'm not a master. A soldier is always best when they've got the best general and they follow the orders of that general. Fun fact, you know Hitler was scared to death of General Patton? They used Patton as a decoy so that they thought that the Allied troops were going to land somewhere else because that's where Patton was at. He was across the channel saying, all right. They actually had inflatable tanks. They weren't even real tanks. It was a fake army, but they put Patton there, and Hitler was so scared of him, he devoted most of the forces up there. D-Day had been a whole lot worse if there wasn't a good general on our side. Didn't even have to do anything. But his reputation went before. Our Lord has a reputation. But how are people going to hear about it? Unless there's vessels that go out and say, this is just a token 
a sign of what he can do in your life. I can't explain all that he did, but I can tell you that I'm a whole lot better off than I was before. Back then, this would have broke me, but he brought me through it. Yeah, I've got a few scars, but it's just a reminder to tell other people that what I've got now on the inside of me is stronger than anything on the outside. He that's in you is greater than he that is in the world. You may be able to scuff me up, you'll never be able to scuff him up. But what's it all come down to? Do we say, is this not the carpenter? Or when we hear things, when the Holy Ghost starts speaking to your heart, when the message is delivered from any of the men of God that we've had walk through here, is it, okay, Lord, or, well, when did that happen? Why did that change? Why me? Who cares? If he said it, do it. It's the only rule we've got. Well, that doesn't seem like it'd be very enjoyable. Living for Jesus is the most enjoyable life you can ever have. Amen. And as soon as you get your head wrapped around that, there's nothing in your life that you wouldn't give up. It's a hard thing, but he that loves father, mother, son, or daughter more than me, not worthy of me. Show me where Peter took his wife or his mother-in-law with him when he was traveling around with Jesus. Not going to happen. But when they needed Jesus, Jesus showed up, touched his mother-in-law. When you just commit yourself to the Master's hand, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know it's going to be good. And I know it will have everlasting and eternal impact. You'll be laying up treasures in heaven. But all I know is God wants to do more. And he doesn't... It's not that he hadn't done it because he doesn't want to. We're not positioned yet. Thankfully, it's just basic grace. He's saying, if y'all want to get serious, I'm still in the house. But I don't want him to walk out the house and to go somewhere else. I don't want the story to be, well, look at all the great things he did in chapter number five. Look at all the great things he did in chapter number seven. I don't want to be chapter number six. I don't want to be the place where, well, that's where God met with his people. No, this is the place, slogan is, where God meets with his people. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.